nephelometry, one for nephelometry. Depending on how you, ano, basta something that will help you differentiate the two. Okay? Moving forward, let's go to osmometry. Osmometry sounds familiar, okay? Sounds easy because osmometry is the measurement of osmolality. Osmolality in where, where? Osmolality in your aqueous solution such as your serum, your plasma, and your urine, okay? And usually, okay, we have osmo, um, osmotically active components or substances such as what? These are your glucose, your urea, and your sodium, okay? Glucose, urea, and sodium are usually, when added to the solution, they increases Okay, they increases the osmolality of your solution. Okay, it increases the osmolality of your solution. Having mentioned that now, okay, having mentioned that now, sir, how do we measure osmolality? We measure osmolality how? By measuring your colligative properties. And what are these colligative properties? We have your osmotic pressure, we have your boiling point, your freezing point, and your vapor pressure. So, collectively, they are called your colligative properties. Okay? And these colligative properties are related to one another, but much more related to your osmolality. Okay? It is related to your osmolality. So, in short, we are indirectly measuring osmolality using your colligative properties. And what happens in, what is the effect of osmolality to these colligative properties? So, when osmolality in the solution increases, what happens? Osmotic pressure and boiling point both increases. The freezing point and the vapor pressure, this is vapor pressure, are both depressed or are both decreased. Are you getting me? So, um, if, you're, if you understand me, um, pa, ano na lang sa chat box, okay? So, osmolality again, if the osmolality increases, okay? If the osmolality increases, osmotic pressure, your boiling point are affected, how? It increases. What about, sir, your ano? What about my... What about my freezing point and your vapor pressure? Those two are all, what happens to them is that they are, um, they are decreased. Are we clear? Clear po tayo? Can you uh, answer in the yeah. chat? Yes. Okay. So in osmometry, okay, osmometry is based on measuring changes on the colligative property of a particular solution. Okay. So, um, once that there are increase of this particular particle, take for example, um, there are a lot of glucose, a lot of um, a lot of glucose, a lot of BUN, or a lot of sodium. It will now affect your osmolality. Okay, it will affect your osmolality. And take note, we were mentioning a while back that um, we measure osmolality by measuring its colligative properties. And among those four colligative properties, osmotic pressure, boiling point, freezing point, and vapor pressure, the most commonly used method for measuring um, measuring your osmolality and measuring changes in colligative properties of a solution is what? Your freezing point depression. Okay? Your freezing point depression. Okay, here's the thing. Take for example your water. Your what is the what is the freezing point of water? Zero degrees Celsius po. Okay, zero degrees Celsius, correct. Okay, so here's the thing. Okay, we started out friends, Char. So the thing is, okay, take for example you have your water. We added glucose. We added BUN. Sige. We added also sodium, which are osmotically active components what will happen it will increase its it will increase its osmotic uh, osmolality okay and you would also realize that water with those impurity 
would take longer time or higher temperature before it boil and lower temperature, lower than zero degrees Celsius before it freezes. So, nagigets yung point. The more that there are those particles already, the higher the osmolality will be. And so, the changes in the colligative property will also happen. Okay? So, is that clear, chat box? Is that clear? Are we clear with osmolali osmometer? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Moving forward, let's go now to your electrochemistry. Sounds familiar. Okay. Uh, sounds familiar. Maybe some of you um, are, are having a deja vu. Okay. Yes, these are the things that you summarized in Kuali before. Now we are explaining it. And maybe um, just to remind everyone, why am I focusing now on turbidimetry down to mass spectrometry? The thing is, most of the time, sila yung, they are the one, the topics that are neglected because we are focused on spectro, flame, fluoro, chemi, and even AAS. AAS should be there, okay? AAS should be included there, okay? Included yung AAS, ha? So, most of the time, sa sobrang haba ng mga topics na yun, and sa sobrang, um, it would really take time for students to grasp that I, the, the topics. It would actually... Um, cover the entire time that should be um, allotted for turbidimetry down, okay, for this topic. So, kung mapapansin ninyo, sabi ko, I opted to really cover everything. So, since we're since we're ending sem the semester by December, so we have to cover everything na ayoko naman na naloloka kayo. That's why I allotted your laboratory time for the topics number one to electrophoresis plus AAS, okay? Plus AAS. Okay. So, let's move forward to your electrochemistry. Okay? For electrochemistry, electrochemistry involves now the measurement of your current or your voltage that are generated because of the activity of your specific ions. So, specific ions give off specific current or voltage depending on the analytic technique that we are using. So, right now, uh, we will be differentiating four, actually five, plus one, plus conductance. We will be differentiating five um, electrochemistry techniques. One is potentiometry, colometry, voltammetry, amperometry. Do not be afraid, okay? Do not be afraid because most of these are actually terms. That's why I need you guys to read and study. In, in just a matter of um, your... Midterm exam will be the last week of last week of October. So we need to really be ready. We really need to study harder. Okay. It's midterms. It's time to um I know polarography not kasama. The one lang that are here, Angel. Okay. So moving forward, okay. Moving forward. So analytes, okay, analytes undergo electrochemical changes electrochemical reaction specifically oxidation and reduction so when a particular ion reduce are reduced or are oxidized they will now affect the electrode um, in our instruments and in measuring your current and your voltage these are actually um, generated by the activities of specific ions yun nga yung sinasabi ko kanina so specific ions have their own um, potential energy, the current, and the voltage that are being generated. So let us go now to the first one, which is your potentiometry. In potentiometry, okay, in potentiometry, the measurement of potential or the voltage be between two, electro two electrodes in the solution is the basis for the variety of procedures for measuring analyte concentration. So meaning to say we have two electrodes, and what are those electrodes we have your reference electrode and we also have your indicator or your analytical or your measuring electrode we'll get to that later on but please write this down everybody that in potentiometry we are able to measure the concentration of a particular substance by measuring the difference between the two electrodes the reference and the indicator the difference between the two that will now reflect the concentration of the ion that you are measuring. Are we clear? So let us go now to the two 
electrodes. In potentiometry, later naman, lalabas pa ulit yun. Okay, let us discuss the two electrodes. We have your reference electrode and we also have later on your measuring electrode. So your reference electrode is, of course, an electrode. An electrode that is constant and completely insensitive to the composition of the solution under study. So what are we trying to say here? That... When it comes to reference electrode, the reference electrode should not be affected by the one you are measuring. So meaning to say, if I put in electrical current in the system, okay, if I put in an electrical current in the system, the reference electrode will not get affected by whatever substance I am measuring. For potentiometry, please write it down. In potentiometry, we are usually using this in the measurement of your pH. In the measurement of your pH or more specifically, the measurement of your hydrogen ion. Okay? The measurement of your hydrogen ion. Meaning to say, since we're talking about pH, the reference electrode should not be affected by your hydrogen ion. Are we clear? The reference electrode should not be affected by your hydrogen ion. So, what should be the ideal characteristic of your reference electrode? Number one, it should conform to the nurse equation. Nakikita nyo na ba kung paano ko tatanungin sa quiz? All of the following are true about a reference electrode except, okay? So dapat kilala nyo na ako by, by this time when it comes to the quizzes. So next, it should exhibit a potential that is constant with time, okay? Number one, a reference electrode should be constant, okay? Because... Um, if there is fluctuation with the 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 potential or the voltage within your your reference electrode, it will affect your measurement. Okay, it will also affect our measurement. So having said that, um, your reference electrode should also be able to return in its original potential after being subjected to small current. Okay. So, dapat nakakabalik siya agad. And of course, last, last but definitely not the least, there should be, uh, it should only exhibit, exhibit little hysteresis or lags with temperature cycling. What do you mean by temperature cycling? Um, your, elect, your reference electrodes kasi, your electrodes will be subjected into different current, electrical current different level so to speak and different level of electrical current also mean different temperature so meaning to say mag-iiba-iba yung temperature niya and that reference electrode should be able to cope up to that or adapt to that fast which just little lag okay little small lang yung lags nila are we clear with the refer reference electrode so that is the reference electrode now so in the laboratory we usually use two major um, reference electrode. One is the mercury, mercurious chloride, and the silver, silver chloride reference electrode. So let us differentiate one from the other. So mercury, mercurious chloride is a frequently used reference electrode, although, okay, although the disadvantage here is that it is slow to reach a new stable voltage, okay? So meaning to say, yung hysteresis na pinag-uusapan natin. It would take time for your mercury mercurious chloride to move into one voltage to the other to the other. Okay? One voltage to the other. Okay? It would take time for it to adjust. Aside from that, okay? Aside from aside from that, um not only does we have that we have issue when it comes to it um changing in a new voltage your mercury mercury chloride is also unstable at 80 degrees centigrade. Wala bang magtatanong sa akin? So probably um, you haven't uh, did your advanced reading. So here, okay, the thing here is that in Bishop, okay, those who are using Bishop, um, this is the one written, okay? It is unstable at 80 degrees centigrade. But when you go to, ano, when you go to Henry's, Henry summarized, Na, okay? Because um, ang nakalagay kay Henry's is that greater than 60 degrees, hindi na kaya ni mercury, mercury chloride. Okay, let me just say it again. If it is greater than 60 degrees, higher than 60 degrees, mercury, mercury chloride will already become unstable. Sir, what are we going to follow? We're going to follow what? We're going to follow what reference? We're going to follow the Henry. 60 
well, eventually, ganun din naman yan, oh, di ba? Above 80, ganun na rin yan. 80 degrees, okay, higher than that, unstable na si mercury, mercurius chloride. On the other hand, we also have another electrode, which is your silver, silver chloride. Your silver, silver chloride is another reference electrode that is being used, but this time, here's the thing with silver, silver chloride. It has, um, it can be used um, at higher temperatures, okay? Because it can go up greater than 60 degrees and even greater than until 275 degrees centigrade, okay? And aside from that, your your silver silver chloride are also compact electrode comparing it to your mercury. Am I clear? Clear po tayo. So in in electrochemistry, ganito yung mangyayari. Electrochemistry, you will try to differentiate potentiometry from colometry, from ISE, amperometry, voltametry. And within potentiometry, punta lang muna tayo po ay potentiometry, you should be able to differentiate what electro reference electrode is and what a measuring electrode is. And in the reference electrode, there are two. Okay? Your mercury, mercurius chloride, and your silver, silver chloride. Okay? And by this time, I just want to congratulate everyone because you made this this far. And alam ko, there are a lot of things that you're studying right now. And looking back on my third year, nakaka, alam mo yun, nakaka, nakaka, ano, nakaka, nakaka miss, mabombard ng maraming information. And I know that you're going through that right now. But I know you will, ano, you will get through this. Okay? So, um, let me just clarify. Mercury is unstable above 60 degrees. But silver, silver chloride is stable. Stable. Stable above 60 degrees. Okay? Stable until 60 degrees. All right? So, I hope that's clear. Okay, let's move forward. We have your reference electrode. Now, we have your measuring electrode also known as your indicator electrode, also known as your analytical electrode. Okay? Analytical electrode. Sir, can we... Uh, sir, pag sinagot ko ba indicator, sinagot ko analytical, sinagot ko measuring, yes, kahit anong isagot mo kapatid, tama yan. Okay? So, measuring electrode, sir, why is it that um, it was mentioned here that it should be sensitive to hydrogen ion? Because in this case, what we are measuring is what, again, your pH. PH or your hydrogen ion concentration. So meaning to say, opposing now, okay, comparing it now to your reference me, reference electrode, your measuring electrode should be sensitive to the analyte that you want to measure. Your um your reference should be insensitive. It should not be affected. Okay? It should not be affected by the um uh, analyte that you are measuring. So here's the thing now. In potentiometry, the concentration of your ions in the solution can be calculated how? From the measured potential difference. The measured potential difference between your reference electrode and your measuring electrode. And the measured cell potential, okay? The measured cell potential is related to the molar concentration by nurse equation. So what, sir? Medyo na lost ako doon. Okay? Can you please repeat that? Ito lang yung sinabi niya. The, di the, the difference or the measured potential, the measured potential that we came up with, the difference between reference and the measuring electrode is equal to the concentration of your ion. Okay? And if you want to, um, how is that depicted? That is depicted by your nurse nursed equation. Are we clear, chat box? Okay. So, ayun ha. So, we're moving now. Okay? Potentiometry. Okay. Potentiometry. Difference ng reference electrode and ng um, measuring electrode is equal to poten um, cell potential which is directly proportional to your molar concentration. Let's move forward to your ion selective electrode. Ion selective electrodes okay, is an electrochemical transducer capable of responding to one specific ion. One specific ion, sir, 
Yes, one specific ion. So meaning to say, we have one ISE only dedicated, committed to your pH, one for your sodium, one for your calcium, and one for your potassium. Okay? So this ion selective electrodes, okay, this ion selective electrodes are very sensitive and selective on the ion that they are measuring. So meaning to say, they only want to measure what they are made to measure. Okay? Hindi sila yung flexible that can adapt kung ano yung ibinigay, ano yung unang um, instruction, yun na yun. Okay? So there are different membranes. Okay? Your ion selective electrodes are made up of different membrane. And those different membrane set apart one ion selective electrode from the other. So meaning to say, a glass ion selective electrode are specific and sensitive for the measurement of hydrogen ion. Okay? Sir, baka may nalilito sa inyo, no? Bakit tinasinabi ni Sir Gandhi, hydrogen ion, tapos ba't pH? Guys, pH is the, uh, pH measurement is equal to hydrogen ion. Nagigets nyo ako? Yung hydrogen ion natin, yung hydrogen ion concentration is expressed by pH. Clear? Chat box? Okay. Wala pang sumagot. Okay? Science so, siya. Okay? I'm just making sure baka merong nalulos in uh, nalulos sa atin. So glass ion and selective electrode are dedicated for your pH. Milea, uh, different na to. We're already on the ion selective electrode na. Yeah. Ion selective electrode. Another. Okay. So ion selective electrode. So where was I? Okay, okay. Here I am. <laughs> in the ion selective electrode, okay, in the ion selective electrode, we have now the glass aluminum silicate, okay? The glass aluminum silicate is dedicated for your sodium. Your ion selective electrode, dioptyl phenyl phosphonate, is for your calcium. In your ion selective electrode that has a valinomycin membrane, is specific for potassium. Okay? Guys, why did I um, spend time to write this for? Because not only does it is in your book, lumabas na po ito sa board exam. So, meron ka ng four points, kapatid. You have you are four points ahead of being a top notcher on um, your September 20, uh, on the, ano, the 2022 board exam. Oh, yes naman. ba? So, Moving forward now, for um, after your ion selective electrode, we go now to your electrochemistry, which is your colometry. In your colometry, we measure the quantity of electricity expressed in columns that is needed to convert an analyte to a different oxidation state. Okay, different oxidation state. And usually in colometry, we are measuring your chloride ion in your serum in your plasma, in your CSF, and even in your sweat, okay? Even your sweat sample. Yes, literally all, all fluid that you can imagine that is coming out in the human's body is being measured by a medical technologist. Sir, even my tears, yes, your tears can even can be a sample for a bacteriology if you may... Um, if you may want to add your tears, okay? So, moving forward now, okay? Sir, bakit po naka-bold? Bakit po naka-underline si sweat test? What condition is being detected? Um, why do we measure chloride in sweat? What are we trying to diagnose or what are we trying to... What disease are we looking for? Anyone from the chat box? Anyone? Okay, very good. Okay. The correct answer is what? The correct answer is... Okay, the correct answer is cystic fibrosis. Okay? Cystic fibrosis. Okay? CSF is not a disease. CSF is cerebrospinal fluid. Okay? Cerebrospinal fluid. So, in sweat tests, we are measuring chloride in your sweat to... Um, diagnose or to determine your um, cystic fibrosis, also known as your mucoviscidosis. Okay? Mucoviscidosis. Sir, 
spelling, cystic fibrosis, lumala. Guys, eto ha, pag sina once that you hear um <coughs> whenever you hear um whenever you hear um chloride sweat test, laging cystic fibrosis. Okay, cystic fibrosis or your muco pesidosis. Mucovis VC dosis. Okay, it's on the chat box already. Mucoviscidosis. Okay? So moving forward now, that is for your um that is for your colometry. So let's try to compare ha, potentiometry difference between your reference and your uh, measuring electrode. The difference between the potential, the potential or the yeah, the potential between the two. On your colometry naman, the amount of electricity that you need to oxidize a particular sample. So in this case, take for example for chloride, it will now um it will now um combine with your silver ion. So the amount of um the amount of silver ions released by ionization is directly proportional to the amount of chloride in the ion. Okay? So kung gaano kadaming silver yung kailangan mong i-release for for it to couple with your chloride okay to become silver chloride that is also the amount of your chloride obviously okay so that is for your colometry now, let's go now to your amperometry okay amperometry what is amperometry amperometry this time is the measurement of the current flow produced by an oxidation reduction reaction are we clear? So let me just try to differentiate colometry from amperometry. Okay? Amperometry. So here, okay? So here, you, you applied electricity to oxidize. So what you are measuring is the uh, how much should I need to apply for it to oxidize. Pag amperometry naman, okay, amperometry, there is oxidation. There is reduction in the system. The thing that you're going to measure now is the current flow from the oxidation reduction. Nakikita yung difference? Can you see the difference, guys? In the colometry, ikaw nagbigay ng electricity for it to oxidize. In amperometry, there is already oxidation. There is reduction in the system. What you want to measure now is the current flow produced by that reaction. Okay? And now the change in the current is measured through the cell and the change is directly proportional to the partial pressure of oxygen present in the specimen. Which leads me to my next point that amperometry is usually being used in the measurement of your partial oxygen. Are we clear? Hello? Are we still clear, chat box? Okay. So that is for amperometry, ha? That is for amperometry. So, take for example, there is already a constant, um, constant na, na current flow in the system. But after oxidation, and reduction, there will be changes. And that is what you want to measure. Okay? That is what you want to measure. Again, directly proportional to the oxygen level. Now we go to voltammetry. Okay? Now we go to voltammetry. And voltammetry, it is a method now um, in which a potential is applied in an electrochemical cell and the resulting current is measured. Okay? The resulting current is being measured. The advantages, guys, of voltammetry is that it's very sensitive and are capable of multi-element measurement. Unlike your ISE, na 1 is to 1, okay? Specific is to specific, ganyan. This one, your, your voltammetry own, um, is very sensitive and can measure multi-element Okay, can do multi-element measurement. And aside from that, it also consumes only a minimal amount of analyte. So, konting sample lang daw ang kanyang kinoconsume. Okay? So, one example of voltammetry is used in the measurement of heavy metals such as your lead, which are your anodic, uh, which is your anodic stripping voltammetry. 
Okay? Anodic stripping voltammetry. I hope you guys are copying the PowerPoint and also reading your book side by side because yeah, I did um um technically yung PowerPoint ko medyo summarize summarize summary na yan ng inyong ng inyong book. Okay, nandiyan po chapter 4 and page 46 of your Henry's. So let's go now to the last one. Okay, that is voltammetry. Let's go to the last, which is your conductance. Your conductance is an electrolytic uh, electrolytic conductivity is a measure of the ability of a particular solution to carry an electrical current. Okay? Conductance is the opposite of resistivity or resistance. Okay? Conductivity is um, the opposite of resistivity. So, in this particular, um, in this particular uh, technique, conductance is used in in what? In measuring water impurity. So, water the the a pure water would be free from ions. Would be free from um, they would be free from other elements. Okay, meaning to say, it will not become a conduct. Yung hindi siya, it will not become a, a conductor. Okay? So, it can also be used in measuring um, your urea and these are being used as detectors for your high-performance liquid chromatography which will be discussed even um, next meeting and also um, in cell counters and capillary electrophoresis. So, that is for your conductance. So, to wrap it up, in electrochemistry, we have five, your potentiometry. We have your... Um, we have your potentiometry, colometry, amperometry, voltammetry, and conductance. Okay? Vo voltammetry and your conductance. Let me just correct myself. Okay? Let me just correct myself. Milea, okay? High O1, high O2, high O1 pala to. High O2, O3. So, Milea have a question. Uh, sir, under po, yung, yung measuring electrode, yung measuring electrode natin, um, is for your potentiometry, ha? Potentiometry siya. Okay, so I'll entertain your questions later. So let's move forward to your chromatography. Okay, let's move forward to your chromatography. And by the way, um, chromatography, have you done chromatography before in your clinical chem? Okay, may isa pa ulit question. Nakakatawa. Ibig sabihin, nandun kayo sa Henry's kasi nakita nyo si impedance. I opted not to include impedance because we will that will be discussed in the automation and hematology. And even flow cytometry. Are we clear? So, impedance and flow cytometry are actually more specific for your um, more specific for your clinical hematology. The five are your ano, um, potentiometry, colometry, amperometry, voltammetry, and your conductance. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's go now to your um, let's go now to your chromatography. So chromatography is a technique that separates mixture into individual components, okay? And it is used to separate complex mixtures on the basis of different physical interactions between the individual compound and the stationary phase of the system. So later on, we'll be discussing the basic components of chromatography. But let me just, um, let me just say what chromatography does first. So chromatography, so take for example, I have a water... I have a solution, rather, I have a solution that contains sodium chloride, sodium chloride, and sodium potassium and chloride. Or take for example, merong ano siya, meron siyang different components like drugs or yeah, different therapeutic drugs. And I want to measure each one of them. Okay, I want to measure each one of them. I can perform chromatography. So number one, chromatography separates your mixture. Take for example, you have a homogeneous mixture you are able to separate each component from the other using chromatography. But not only that, okay? Not only that you separate the mixture according to its component, but using chromatography, you are also able to identify what specific compound that is, okay? What specific compound that is, which will be discussed in matter of 
three slides from now. And aside from that, in chromatography, okay, not only are you able to separate them, not only are you able to identify them, but eventually you are also able to measure them, okay? You're also able to measure them, okay? So that is what chromatography is all about. So let us go to the basic components first. Okay, the basic components of your chromatography are first your mobile phase. Your mobile phase is a solvent or a mixture whereby your sample is added. Okay, your mobile phase. Take for example, ito yung ano. Ito yung, take for example, I am the, I am the sample. The mobile phase is obviously the mobile. Okay, yung mga sasakyan. That would um, in the stationary phase, the stationary phase is where the mobile phase flows. So meaning to say, ito yung kalsada. Okay? So take for example, okay? Um, we want to, we want to, we want to um, identify one from the other. We want to identify, there are, take for example, there are three students in a mobile phase. Okay? There, there are three students. I'm making an analogy ha para may imagine ninyo. There are three students, okay, there are three students, hindi natin alam kung saan school sila. Okay, hindi natin alam kung saan school sila taga roon, okay? But because of but because of the um, chromatography, we'll be able to identify them. So all of them are on the same mobile phase. And then all of them will be passing through the same stationary phase. Okay, I think, I think for example, doon lang tayo sa U-Belt para tabi-tabi yung school. Okay, you would be able to identify them because one will get off Espana, UST, one will get off at um, Gastambide, your UE, and what one will get off Moraita in FEU. So in that case now, you're able to identify um, among those students which are US, um, Tomasian, Tamarao, and UE Red Warriors. So parang ganun din sa, sa mga components natin. You're able to identify which one is um, cocaine. You're able to identify which is <clears throat> um, which one is digoxin, which one is amphetamine, which one is tetrahydrocannabinol because of their um, appearance in the chromatography. Are we still clear? So the separated now after the from the mixture, once that they are separated, they will now be called eluate. So let me just show you a picture of an eluate. Okay? This is an example. So as you can see, all of this, all of these things are belonging to the same specific, same solution kanina. But now we are able to differ, we are able to um separate them. So this B1 here, the B2 here, the C1, the E, the E1 here, all of them are signifying an individual analyte. Are we clear, chat box? Are we clear? So all of those components, okay, all of those components are separated. Okay, are we, oh, walang sumasagot sa chat box. Okay, so um, that is for your um, chromatography. Okay, that is for your chromatography. So moving forward now, okay, wait. Moving forward, how are these um, components separated from one another? One big factor there is because of their polarity. Okay, one ex one um, reason there is their polarity. The attractive forces that encompasses the total interaction of the solvent molecule, meaning to say the uh, mobile phase with the sample molecules, and also the the attractive forces between your sample and the stationary phase. So meaning to say, the, sum, the solution that passes through your mobile phase, there is an effect causing its separation already. And as they pass through the mobile phase, okay, as they pass through the mobile phase, they are also separated on how they interact with the mobile phase. Okay? How they interact with the mobile phase. That is how they are separated from one another because of their different polarities. Okay? Because of their different polarities. Sir, now that they are separated, I want to identify them. How can I identify them? You can identify them by using their by identifying their retention time. Retention time, you have a formula there. Retention time is the time it takes for a compound to elute. 
Okay? For a compound to elute or for them to separate. Okay? So, you will now... I, ang ingay naman. Sorry. Okay, you will now identify... Okay, you will now identify um, a particular compound because of their retention time. So, the value is a characteristic of a... The value is a characteristic of a compound and it's related to the strength of its interaction with the stationary phase and the mobile phase. So, meaning to say... The retention time, therefore, can be used to determine the compound's identity. Are we clear? So when I ask, how can I, identi I identify a compound's identity using chromatography? The answer is because of its retention time. Are we clear? Sir, medyo pa ulit po, sir. Yan kasi medyo na wala po ako. Okay. So again, okay, we are able to identify the identity of a compound because or due to their retention time. Okay? Due to their retention time. Moving forward now, I have only like a couple of four slides and this will be the final 10 minutes and the final coverage for the quiz on Monday. So we have four modes of separation, okay? We have four... Sir, ano po yung mobile phase ng mga analytes? The mobile phase of an analyte are the... are Take for example, it can be usually solid siya. Ito later. Um, merong paper, merong... Merong... Merong paper, merong gel but usually in general most of the mobile phase are solid i want you to look i want you to imagine electrophoresis electrophoresis are somehow similar with chromatography it's just that electrophoresis has current chromatography um you have the mobile phase that drives the component into the mobile into the stationary phase okay so ayan so later on uh, the different chromatographic techniques actually differ on the mobile phase rather than the stationary phase. Meron tayong ga gas chromatography, meron tayong liquid chromatography. So I'll explain that in the succeeding topics. So let me just finish this first. So in the chromatography, we have mode of separation. That is the adsorption. First is the adsorption, the partition, steric exclusion, and ion exchange. So let me go first to adsorption, okay? Adsorption. So adsorption is based on competition. So competition between the sample and the mobile phase. They compete in the absorptive sites of the stationary phase. So take for example, it is your Wattman paper, okay? Your Wattman paper. Um, take for example, you have here your alcohol and your water. You want to separate one from the other. So they would um, they would compete from one another. So the molecules that is most soluble, again, ha, most soluble, ibig sabihin, it, it really did, again, talk about the interaction of your molecule and your mobile phase and the interaction as well of your sample or your, your analytes to the mobile to the stationary phase so nakadepende ya uh, the the solubility of your molecules okay uh, will determine who would move faster in the move faster in the in the solution so what do i mean by moving faster so as they move faster parang ito they would now be separated from one another. This is your B2. This is your B1. This one here, are we can say that this was absorbed absorb easily because it has um, um, higher uh, solubility or it is, most, it is the most soluble between the two compounds. That's why it is the one that is up here, okay? And moving forward, okay, usually, ayan, Usually your adsorption, okay, usually your adsorption is seen in liquid solid chromatography. Okay? Liquid solid chromatography. Moving forward now, let's go to your partition. Your partition, or let me just clear the air immediately. The partition is usually done or usually the separation technique in your liquid liquid chromatography. 
Sir, liquid-liquid chromatography? What do you mean by that? Meaning to say, liquid si mobile face, liquid din po si stationary face. Okay? Liquid-liquid. So, let us go here. So, separation is based on the relative solubility, again, solubility again, of your compound in organic and aqueous solvent. Okay? In organic and um, aqueous solvent. So, what happened here is that you will be adding an immiscible solvent, usually um, an organic solvent. So, meaning to say, nonpolar. What will happen is that after adding that, sabi natin, immiscible, it's like water and oil. They will not mix, okay? But you are pretty much aware that in that aqueous solution, there are some organic or some nonpolar compounds. And what you want to do is to extract that, okay? Which leads me now into saying that partition is also extraction, Okay? Partition and extraction. Uh, partition and extraction are one and the same. Okay? So, what happens is that molecules containing a polar and a nonpolar group in an aqueous solution, okay, when an immiscible organic solvent is added, and then what will happen, what you will do is to shake it. Okay? You will shake it. Okay? You will shake it and then the... Depending, kunwari, ang, ang dinagdag mo is an organic solvent. The organic compounds in the, in, the, in the solution will move into the organic, or organic solvent, the one that you added. Okay? So take for example, nag-add ka, nag ka ng immiscible na organic compound. Yung organic compound na nandun sa solution mo will be... Uh, will be uh, migrating to the immiscible. Nagigets ba ako? It will now move, it will now extract the or organic from the solution. Okay? So that is the partition. So usually liquid-liquid chromatography siya. Okay? Liquid-liquid chromatography. So let us move forward. I only have four minutes. Okay? So we also have here your steric exclusion. Steric exclusion is similar to your adsorption. What is the difference? Not only is it affected by its solubility, but also affected, okay, we are um, trying to differ. Ito yung ano, sir, paano pag they have the same solubility? How can I differentiate them? The answer is steric exclusion because it is now based on their size and their shape. So, it is the variation of a liquid-solid chromatography Usually, the solid, um, solid stationary phase is a gel. So, it is all known as a size exclusion or, or molecular exclusion or molecular sieve chromatography. Yun yung ano niya. Either size exclusion chromatography, molecular exclusion chromatography, or molecular sieve chromatography. How does it look like? Ganito siya. Okay, this is your size exclusion chromatography. Can you see it? Chat box, can you please confirm? So, this, take for example, the, this ions here, the one in blue and the one in red, are of the same solubility. So, you would have a hard time differentiating or separating the two. But, it was answered now by size exclusion chromatography, uh, okay, your steric exclusion, whereby smaller okay smaller compounds will migrate faster into the mobile into the stationary phase and the larger okay the larger molecules would take longer time okay would take longer time for the for them to migrate into the mobile phase meaning to say the reten again you are able to identify them because of the difference now of their retention time okay are we clear with that so, ganun siya ha. It is composed of gel. The last but not the least is a is an ion exchange chromatography. Ion exchange chromatography, um, solute mixtures are separated by magnitude and charge of their ionic species. So, stationary phase are your resins, okay? Your resins can be cut ion or an ion resin. So, let me just try to differentiate the four ways to separate using your chromatography. We had your adsorption, we had your partition, we have your steric exclusion, and then we have your 
your ion exchange. Here's the thing, okay? So, for adsorption chromatography, we, separ you, we separate them according to their solubility. How fast are they absorbed from the mobile phase, okay? Your partition, on the other hand, is based on their relative solubility. We have two phases. One that is the... the, the solvent that you are adding are is immiscible to the other. So meaning to say, hindi sila nagmimix. Okay? And what you will do there is to separate the organic from the inorganic from one another. And that is done through partition chromatography. On the other hand, we also have your size exclusion chromatography or your steric exclusion whereby you separate... Okay, you separate molecules not only based on their polarity or solubility, but also based on their size and their shape. Sir, San Tomas helpful. It is very much helpful if both of your sample has the same absorption, um, had the same solubility. And now you want, you know that there are two different components in there, and you want to separate that. What you're going to do is to separate them based on their size and their shape using size exclusion chromatography. And last but not the least is your ion exchange chromatography, whereby the, the, you are trying now to separate your, your molecules, you separate your compounds based on what? Based on their ionic charges. So if you are having an ionic, uh, if you are, are having an anionic um, resin, you will now be um, attracting, of course, the positively signed, the cation. If you have the cation, you will be um, attracting now in your, will be separating now the anion. So that is for the methods of separation. The rest of the chromatography will be discussed on Monday. So your quiz will be an, uh, from spectrophotometry up until ion exchange chromatography. Okay? So... That would be all for today. Thank you so much. So I'm stopping the recording now.